Hi, and welcome to this part four of our little quickie that's all about repairing a drill press. Yes, I said part four of a little quickie. It doesn't make much sense. And if my real life little quickies were that long, well, I'd probably be dead by now. We're going to start today by finding our center position between the two flats. So from one flat to the other, we want to position the axis of the mill's spindle directly over that uh, central point. And to do that, well, we're going to use our hedge finder. So we're going to touch off one flat, set my graduated scale to zero. I'm then going to lift the hedge finder to clear the part. I'm going to advance another uh, 0.1 inches and that will put the center of my edge finder that has a 0.2 inch tip on it. It's going to put the center directly over that surface. Then I'm going to move half the width of the part. I'll be on zero again because 0.1 is one full turn. So I'll be on the zero on my scale. Then I'm going to move half the width of the part and half the width of the part across flats here is one inch 344 thousandths. So let's do that. So note that I locked my Y axis here. I'm on center, I don't want to move that anymore, so I locked it down tightly. Now what we want to do is find our edge on one of these cylindrical surfaces. And that's a problem, because these wiggler type uh, edge finders do not work well on cylindrical surfaces. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to use the touch-off method, and for that I need an accurate cylinder an accurate as far as known diameter and good finish on it. And for that cylinder, I'm going to use this center drill, which is the same center drill that I'm going to be using to drill my holes. So that'll save me a setup. Because I'm the lazy machinist. But the touch-off me method is when I touch off an edge with something that is rigid. In this case, my uh, center drill. It's hard to judge how much pressure we're applying when we touch off. And that's why with the touch off method that we use these uh, shim stocks or a feeler gauge in this case. And I'm going to be using a ten thousandths of an inch feeler gauge for this job. I'm going to come and touch off positioning my feeler gauge between my center drill and my part. And that way I can judge by sliding the shim stock or the feeler gauge back and forth how much pressure I'm applying and really get a good position. Once I have touched off, well I'm going to raise my center drill to clear the part. I'm going to keep moving in my x-axis in the same direction because I will have put my collar to zero. So I'm going to keep moving in that same direction the thickness of this shim stock, so ten thousandths of an inch, plus half the thickness of my touch-off cylinder, and in this case, my touch-off cylinder is a quarter inch uh, center drill, so I'm going to be moving an eighth of an inch, so 125 thousandths plus ten thou, so that's 135 thousandths. And that'll position the axis of my machine directly above the cylindrical edge of the part. but it's important to note here, the cylinder has no real good part to edge find. You have to know where you are. And that's why we did our y-axis first, because we're on center on our y-axis. I know that I'll be edge finding the furthest portion of my cylindrical surface. So let's take a look at that.
So I'm directly above my edge and I'm on zero on my scale. Now, the largest part of the hole that I have to produce here is 600 thou a counterbore. My counterbore measures 600 thousandths of an inch. And I would like this counterbore to come just flush with the edge. Why? Well, because I'm going to bevel the edge eventually, a little later in the project, and that'll give me a nice parabolic curve there, and that's going to look really nice. You'll see what I mean when we get there. But let's just say that I want my edge to be just flush with the side of the part. That means that this center hole needs to be drilled 300 thou from that edge. So I'm going to move 300 thou. I'm on zero because I set my zero just moments ago. And I'm going to center drill that hole. Then I'm going to redo this exact same operation on the other side for my second center drill. And we'll get back together once I've completed that uh, second center drill. So now I have my two center holes produced. We can pull the part from the machine and head over to our drill press to complete these holes. Now why the drill press? Because it's a lot easier to work on the drill press for this type of operations. If I stayed here, well I'd be continually repositioning myself and really wasting a lot of time. You'll see the drill press is quite quick and easy for this type of work. So let's head over there. So we're set up here and ready to drill. And we have three operations left to perform to finish these holes. We have a tap drill hole to produce, we have a clearance hole to produce, and we have our counter bore to produce. Now, our tab drill is a 5 16 for that 3 8 16 hole. My clearance drill here is a Y drill. Why? Because we love you. And if you get that reference, well, you probably, as I do, think that Annette Funicello is a very attractive lady. And, well, my counterbore is a standard counterbore for a 3 16 socket head cap screw. Sequence is everything here, and most people, most people who are starting out, would probably start, it's just human nature, with the smallest hole, which is the tab drill size. And that would be a big mistake. Remember, if you're pre-drilling a hole, we said that the pre-drilled hole should be slightly smaller than the chisel edge on the next drill coming. And in this case, well, that just wouldn't work. My next drill coming would really bind in that hole. I wouldn't get a good finish. It would not be a good situation. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to do what I should do, the proper sequence. And that would be to drill my clearance hole first to the depth that I need that clearance hole drilled, which is just a little past that center line of the hole. That's why we laid out that line there to start with. Then I'm going to drill my tap drill hole and then finally I'm going to counter bore. And at the end I'm going to use this clearance hole to guide my tap to tap to start the tap in straight. I won't be able to finish the tap until I've cut the part in two because my taps just aren't long enough. So we're going to want to start drilling and we're going to start with our clearance hole. Now you can see here just how easy it is to set your depth stop and here's where I've set it just past the center once you, when you've scribed a line like that. So this isn't an accurate operation but it can be a finicky one but once that line is scribed well it becomes very easy to set my depth. So my depth here is set just past that line which is just what I want for now. Now, let's drill that hole.
Well, we really blasted through that, but I mean, it is just drilling. As I said, it's the sequence that matters here. Now, we're done with the drilling and we've counterbored both holes. And it went really well because on this type of drill press, while well, setting the depth is really easy. Most people would move on to, at this point, to cutting the part in two. But as I've already mentioned, that would be a mistake because we have these holes to tap in their bottom. And before I cut it in two, I can see by inserting the tap into that hole that I have a natural guide. I have a long clearance hole that finishes at the bottom with my tapped drill sized hole. And that'll guide my tap perfectly. So you can see that the tap doesn't protrude far enough to permit me to completely tap my hole. But I can get the tap well engaged. And that'll mean that once I do cut this part in two, I'll have enough thread in the bottom there to start my tap off good and true. So next operation, head over to the workbench because that's the proper place to do tapping and tap those two holes. Now we can move on to the cutoff bandsaw. And note here, and this is important, that the tail end of the bandsaw's vise is supported by a screw jack. And that's because we're holding the part only on its tip. Now, if the vise wasn't supported on its tail end, well, it would cock sideways and would not hold this part properly. It's very important not to let the bandsaw fall through the hole. You have to support it or it will break the blade. It's also important to think about what's going to happen to the part after the cut is complete. Is it going to fall off? Is it going to hit the ground and be damaged? Well, in this case, we have the perfect way from protecting the part from damage. Now, those sawed surfaces are okay as they are. I mean, this would do for the job, but okay isn't good enough for me. I'm going to skin them on the mill here just to clean them up. So I've skimmed my two parts, but I'm not quite done yet. I want to mill an angle on each side of the back part, the part that has the counter board holes in them. And I want to cut off at an angle half of the counter board. Why? Because it's going to look really cool. Uh, but for that I had to do a little math. And as you can see, I calculated that, well I measured, that my counter board measured 485 thousandths of an inch deep and 600 thousandths of an inch wide. And I want to just cut it off at the halfway mark. So I calculate using tan that my angle that I'm going to need to do that is 39 degrees. So I made a setup with my protractor, my pr accurate protractor, vernier protractor, and I set my part up at 39 degrees. So let's come and produce that angular cut.
Well, I've deburred the parts, and all that's left now, other than a good cleanup, well, is to finish tapping those two holes. Well, there you go. From old, busted, and ugly. Sometimes I feel like that. To new, functional, and darn right sexy. This was a really fun repair job. And Ben, your drill press is good to go. So, until we meet again, have fun. Be safe. And happy machining.